Welcome to ADF TV. My name is Frank Infius and I'm from the Oracle J Developer and ADF Product Management Team. In this session I talk about ADF task flow programming and architecture best practices. If we look at this screenshot here, then we see the task flow architecture, which is for a bounded task flow and includes input parameters and return values as the public API, so to say. Navigation cases which are defined within, so you have a default activity which is a landing pad, so to say, for this bounded task law. And then you specify navigation cases between the different view activities. Bounded task flows, as you see as well, can have their own managed bean defined. Now it's important to understand that the managed bean that you defined in a bounded task law is not accessible from the outside. It's meant to be private to this task law and it will be deployed if you decide to reuse the task law in an ADF library, for instance. You see the database symbol, which indicates that the task law has the potential to run in its own transaction. There's a setting on the property palette that allows you to specify the task law to run in a separate transaction, which means that commit or rollback of that task law will not impact anything on the outside. Now, this is the base architecture and on the right side you see the component palette which you see at design time with all the different items that you can put into a bounded task law. Bounded task law activities like a view, router and method activity can have page bindings, ADF bindings associated which allows you to declaratively query the business service. If it's ADF business components, a web service or a POJO doesn't matter because the functionality is the same. So, Based on this concept of a closed environment which can communicate to the outside and the input parameter is just one uh, way to communicate to the outside. There is more, there are contextual events, there are bean references and you might want to go back and have a look at the task flows interaction topic that I covered for ADF TV as well where I explain everything in detail on how to communicate with the outside from within a task flow. For this talk it's kind of not really even required to think about a task flow being part of a page, in which case it's a region, or if it's a standalone task flow that you navigate to. So what we want to teach during this session and recommend as a best practice is that you start thinking task flow. In fact, when you build Oracle IDF applications, don't think user interfaces, don't think page flow, think task flows, think unit of work. And the bounded task flow is the unit of work to deal with. Now, we put in the header of task-oriented architecture and if you're bound to or familiar with service-oriented architecture where you think services, then that's exactly on a, not the same level, but on a similar level in task flows. Every bounded task flow could provide some sort of functionality which actually makes it a service. So if you think it that way and if you maintain a requirement list that identifies task flow functionalities as unit of works and if you maintain an inventory of existing task flow which you want to reuse then this helps you to understand which of your task flows needs to have no dependency which means they are loosely coupled which means that all the communication goes through the input parameter and the return values or if your task flows are kind of implementation details which just help you to partition the work on a specific application so that you can have different development teams, maybe distributed development teams working on the same goal but not interrupting themselves by maybe having a bug in their work that will then have an impact to other teams. So you can do it that way. So think about loose coupling, which of your task flows needs to have isolated mode in the sense that they need to be standalone and which of them can have dependencies and even a shared data control which is of better performance as we'll learn in a second um, creates a specific dependency. So another aspect of task flow which really makes sense to look at that is to use task flows as a common language. You will definitely have the requirement to talk with non-technical audiences about the project that you're building or the application you're building. They understand their work, you understand your work, now you have to find a common language and because task flows are developed or designed purely declarative, it's a very good shared language that you can use. Everyone will understand what a view is, what a method is, so you don't have to drill down into how in the end Java will be called or the binding layer. So you can discuss that with the people that are responsible for later on working with the application. You can also set everything 
through properties and there are display properties in the property palette that allow you to describe what a specific task row is doing as well as annotations in the component palette. In the component palette for a task row there are annotations which you can just put for a specific activity and then explain what that activity is doing be it that this is just for you to remember what you discussed with the user or if it's in general documentation for the task row as you're working in teams most likely another team member will have to continue your work to some point in time if you're on vacation or working on a different project for instance. Sizing. The good question here is how big should my task row be? Well in the task row talk that I do for ADF TV I said that well there is no strict size for task row since sky is the limit however common sense would make a good judge. Now the recommendation is to keep task rows as big as required but as small as possible and the reason is that task rows typically deal with resources and if they for instance save a lot of state in their managed beans then this resource will take more memory. So if you have smaller task rows then the expectation that users wouldn't spend so long in the task row is valid so that the task row itself could be released by the controller and therefore the memory footprint will just be smaller. Or think about a task row that requires a separate transaction. Now if you have 50 users and you have three task rows and all of these have their own transaction then you have 150 database connections if you work in ADF business component sense. Now if you can restrict or limit the time that a user spends in a task row that has its own transaction then you release that resource pretty quickly and pretty often which means that the overall scalability of your platform will improve. So you want to think about that. Another way of looking at task row is like to encapsulate dependencies. So you can have a task row that for instance um, isn't shown to the application developer. Typically when you create a reusable task row, this task row shows up in the resource pa palette for the application developer to drag and drop into the view controller project. If however a task row is identified as not a top level task row but a task row that is part of a composite, so it's an implementation detail, then I can use the property palette for that task row to hide it from showing in resource catalogs. So this way your task row which consists of four, five, six, ten sub-task rows will only expose one task row which is the starting point that you want the user to have. And all of the implementation details, the other task rows that you don't expose to the outside, they can make assumptions. They could share data controls, they can make assumptions about the data type being passed in as a parameter and so on. Because they are not used outside of your work. And if you're working in a team you can have a kind of a um, API definition by agreement where you say okay now I'm expecting this object to be passed into my task flow so you can lower down the requirements for documentation or even lower even the coding effort as you don't have to code everything generic. Talking about input parameters, well at least the task flow that is the top level task flow deals with input parameters and if you pass data in as an input parameter you will see a lot of uh, demos and I'm guilty as well where we just save the input parameter value in the memory attribute. Now here now you learn this is not really good practice because what you really want to do is you want to define a managed bean in the bounded task flow and that managed bean should be in page flow scope. Now for every input parameter that passes in information you will have a property in that managed bean and a setter and getter pair so that you can access this. The benefits you get out of this little practice is that first of all the properties are discoverable. If I write into the memory scope then at design time this scope doesn't exist. Now how would a peer developer know that this attribute exists? So I have to document it. If I provide this in a managed bean it's discoverable that means this peer developer can find it using the expression builder. I can document a property in my managed bean. I can explicitly say what to do with that property, what it should hold, what values are valid and so on. I could also enforce a specific null pointer exception protection by providing default values and I can have type safe interfaces because if I create a setter and getter then they will have the definition of the type of the argument in it.
So a lot of good arguments to not write input parameter values straight to the memory scope, but just writing to a managed bean that then sits in a managed scope and it's managed by the controller. Talking about managed beans. Now managed beans are classes that are managed by Java server faces or the ADF controller, and this is why they're managed. You don't have to instantiate a managed bean. It's automatically instantiated the first time that it's accessed. Every managed bean lives in a scope and there are a range of scopes available. There are servlet scopes, which are request, session and application. And there are controller specific uh, scopes, which are page flow scope, view scope and backing bean scope. What you should do in your programming, don't use session scope don't use application scope because that would make an assumption in a bounded task about the availability of an attribute outside of your control. Instead, you should assume that everything that is saved in an application session scope is passed to the bounded task law as an input parameter because that really makes you safe from any changes or unpredicted changes on the outside. And if you follow the recommendation on the previous slide, then you have a managed bean. So you would be even be able to recognize if a specific parameter has been passed to you or not. So if the value is null. And if you then work in your bounded task flow, you can purely work with the ADF controller specific scopes, which are page flow scope, view scope, and the backing bean scope. Always think about the um, managed bean as something that operates only on the UI. So it's UI related data and logic. So there shouldn't be any kind of business logic coded into that. If you have business logic, then code that on the business model, on the business service and expose it through the binding layer and use it through the binding layer. So if you follow the recommendation on this slide, all that is left for you to work with are the task flow specific configuration files and logic that executes on the user interface. In terms of scopes, still we have three scopes left, page flow scope and view scope and request scope. If you define a managed bean, make sure that the scope that you select is as small as possible. Now the smallest scope would be none, which is an option, but you know that's almost equivalent to request scope. So if there is a managed bean or if there's a property in a managed bean that doesn't need to hold state, so that doesn't need to remember data, like my example for passing in an input parameter, it needs to remember that data for as long as the task flow runs. So that should be in a long scope. However, if there is just a functionality I'm calling, some computation I'm doing on the UI level, then um, I don't need to keep the state, which means the managed bean can be in a smaller scope, which means that we're releasing it a lot earlier so that resources are not um, growing up so that you have more memory footprint than you naturally need. When you have managed beans, always remember don't reference anything that's outside of the scope of the bounded task law. Yeah? And that is typically what we see users trying to do. They know that a parent task law has a managed bean defined in page flow scope, so they try to get to that information. Now, you already learned in this session that if there is information like that on the outer page or outer task flow, that you should use input parameters to pass that information in. So don't rely on anything that's outside of your bounded task flow. Always look at your bounded task flow as the scope of work that you have. If you need to share something, you can use the data control for that, or you can use the input parameters or contextual events, whatever uh, fits the need. Talking about Data control scopes, I mentioned that the isolated scope is not so good from a performance perspective and the only reason here is that because setting a task to isolate it creates a separate data control frame and this data control frame, if you use ADF business components, will actually create a separate database connection and here's where it becomes expensive. If you're working with EGBs, if you're working with POJOs, what will happen is it will create a second instance of the data control. So still you have two instances there, but this not necessarily then leads to separate database connections. However, with ADF business components, it's certain that there will be additional database connections. So you might be very careful with that. If you're dealing with subtask flows, then because if they are not exposed as standalone task flows on a resource catalog or resource palette, then what you can do is you can use shared data control. 
and the shared data control will make sure that a change on the calling task flow will also reflect in the called task flow. And because you have one single database connection, one single query, that is maintained on the business service side, so that's of a much better performance than isolated. However, there are use cases for having isolated task flows, and this is why the feature is there. So make use of that. Task flow exception handlers, I talked about this when I discussed error handling, which is just a few uh, episodes ago. And the recommendation is to have a task flow exception handler activity defined in every bounded task flow, have a template to build that and enforce that. It helps you to have consistent error handling and it helps you to have error handling that doesn't take the user out of the working context. Imagine you have a subtask flow which is called in a three level structure, so you're three levels deep and there's an exception and this is handled on the parent task flow. Now, the whole stack of task flows will all just go away and you will be put back to the original, the parent task flow. Now, if that is not intended, then that is annoying to the user. So make sure that every bounded task flow tries at least to handle the exception. And still, if you don't want to handle an exception, you can look into the stack trace, just rethrow it and it will kind of bubble up then still. When we look at customer building task flows and task flow diagrams, then not seldom um, we see big task flows. So obviously the first thing they didn't do is they didn't break it up into subtask flow, which we recommend. But then also they built navigation cases for all of the activities. Now in the case where you have a cancel button or where you have a return activity or where you have a commit op operation, something that you want to access from all of the activities within the flow, then it doesn't make sense to draw a navigation case from each of the activities but to use a wildcard navigation. The wildcard navigation, as you can see on the screen, has a very clean approach because it's very easy to understand how that works. If you draw the lines to this kind of um, commonly used activities instead of using wildcard, then you can imagine how the diagram becomes hard to read and even hard to pass. And if it's hard to pass, it's hard to discuss. Now think back about the common language you're kind of defeating the purpose of this common language because no end user will understand what this kind of mess of navigation cases will really mean. And if you have code reviewers coming on site, it's a lot easier for them to understand if they see that there is a navigation case defined as a wildcard instead of just multiple uh, lines that you draw there. So this concludes the task law best practices. There was a lot of talk about architecture and a lot of talk about programming. If you keep two things in mind, First, to think task flow and look at task flows as the unit of work so that you identify bits that need to have reusability and others that are implementation details. And that helps you to protect yourself against any kind of things that can go wrong on the outside because you have a clear defined API, you can partition the work, you have a modular architecture. And that's for sure something you want to keep in mind. And the second one that you want to keep in mind is Managed beans. Managed beans should operate in the scope of the bounded task flow and you should define them in the bounded task flow and you should never make any assumption about the existence of managed beans in the session scope or application scope. So these two little tips at the end will help you to write successful task flows and to get your head around best practices in development with task flows.